Hello all, welcome back to Climate Dynamics. In this lecture, we're continuing to explore atmosphere-ocean interactions. We're going to be discussing the El Nino Southern Oscillation. The reading for this lecture is Marshall and Plum, Chapter 12.2. In this section, we're going to define Walker circulation, Bjorkney's feedback, El Nino Southern Oscillation, and Southern Oscillation Index. The questions we'll answer are, what are the major drivers of zonal tropical circulations? How are the ocean and atmosphere connected in the tropics? What is the normal state of the tropical Pacific? How does the tropical system swap between warm and cold states? And what global impacts are related to El Nino and La Nina conditions? This lecture is broken up into two parts. In the first part, we'll discuss the basics of tropical dynamics. Then we'll discuss the oscillation known as ENSO. Recall in our previous lectures, we discussed the global general circulation. Under this general circulation, rising motion in the equatorial regions, driven by near-surface warming from solar insulation, drives convection. This convection then leads to the generation of the Hadley circulation. Because of the presence of Coriolis force, the Hadley circulation cannot extend from equator to pole, but instead we end up with strong westerly jets occurring at about 30 degrees north, where the Hadley circulation subsides to the near surface. Convergence in the near surface brings air into this tropical region. In the equatorial region, the zonal flow is primarily easterly. That is, the returning branch of the circulation brings in air that is turned to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. Together, this results in an easterly circulation. However, Coriolis force right at the equator is zero and is relatively small in the vicinity of the equator. At the, right at the equator, wind speeds tend to be slower than to the north and to the south because of Coriolis force essentially decaying to zero. This zonally symmetric view of the global system does not account for zonal inhomo inhomogeneity, which is important for governing flows, particularly in the tropics, where the flow is essentially symmetric in the meridional direction. Particularly, this zonally symmetric image does not account for differences between ocean and land, of which there is significant variation in the zonal direction. So in the tropical atmosphere, that is in the vicinity of the equator, Coriolis force is very small. This means that geostrophic balance does not hold. So all of the analysis that we performed previously that was relevant for the subtropics and the mid-latitudes does not immediately apply here, and an alternative analysis is necessary. This also means that baroclinic instability and thus frontal activity is largely absent. The tropics instead features a unique collection of waves and disturbances that are not really found in the mid-latitudes or the polar regions. For instance, equatorial Rossby waves propagate along the equator. As well, equatorial Kelvin waves do the same thing. Upward motion in this region is primarily driven through convective activity, which is inherently chaotic in nature. As we discussed for Rayleigh-Bernard convection, essentially small uh, inhomogeneities can trigger convective plumes. However, actually predicting the location of that convective event can be quite difficult. However, we can nonetheless gain some insight into the drivers of uh, this inhomogeneity through the study of organized convection. In particular, surface temperature differences play a major role in determining zonal in inhomogeneity along the equatorial band. That is, surface temperature differences drive where convection and subsidence tend to occur on a large scale. Again, the study of convection is primarily statistical in nature. So instead of looking at whether or not a convective event will occur in a particular location, we usually look at the climatological statistics of convection. So in particular, when sea surface temperatures are warm, we have typically more convection. When sea surface temperatures are cooler, convection is typically suppressed. These combinations naturally give rise then to differences in surface pressure, which can then drive the atmospheric dynamics in the region. Along the equator, the primary dynamical circulation is known as the Walker circulation. This is in addition to the Hadley circulation, which operates in the meridional direction. The Walker circulation, recall in our last lecture the discussion of the heat capacities of land and ocean. In particular, we discovered that the land surface has a much smaller heat capacity than over the ocean, and consequently responds much faster to solar insulation. That is, under radiation, the land surface will heat up faster than the ocean. This leads to temperature differences that can drive a circulation such as the Walker circulation, but other circulations as well, including, for instance, sea breeze effects. In the uh, tropical atmosphere, 
The walker circulation naturally produces rising motion over the land surface and sinking motion over the oceans. In particular, pay attention to the Pacific Ocean here. Under a strong walker circulation, the rising motion is strong over the maritime continent. This then circulates over the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, sinking as it does so, that is, subsiding, towards the surface in the cooler regions in the eastern Pacific. However, this circulation exists over essentially all of the continents and oceans, in accordance with the picture here. Although the near-surface winds are climatologically easterly along the equator, this does not capture the nuance that's present because of this zonal inhomogeneity. The surface temperature differences end up playing a much greater role in determining the direction of motion. All right, so the Walker circulation is a conceptual model of airflow in the tropics that is caused by differences in heat distribution between ocean and land, and it's the dominant description of this zonal circulation along the equator. Warmer land surface temperatures and colder ocean temperatures are driven by differences in the heat capacities of these two surfaces. The Walker circulation, which is then zonal along the equator, is perpendicular to the Hadley circulation, which describes meridional motions and energy moisture momentum exchanges between the tropics and mid-latitudes. Okay, what about the tropical ocean? Recall we've discussed previously that the easterly wind stress that is dominant in the equatorial near surface, in conjunction with the beta plane, that is the variation of Coriolis force from negative values in the southern hemisphere to positive values in the northern hemisphere, gives rise to divergent flow in the location of the equator. Thus, in the ocean, we must have that there is an induced upwelling along the equator. That is, waters are pulled from below in order to replace the waters that are pushed meridionally towards either pole because of the Ekman layer. Stated another way, the equatorial strip is a region of upwelling, since the trade winds naturally drive fluid away from the equator in the surface layer, and so they demand a supply of water from below. This then produces the induced upwelling that occurs within this region, and consequently produces this shallower thermocline that tends to occur in the equatorial regions as opposed to in the subtropical regions. The air-sea interaction then plays a major role in governing the dynamics of both the atmosphere and the ocean. Since the Pacific Ocean is bounded, the westward equatorial current induced by the wind stress then pushes warm water towards the western Pacific. Meanwhile, we also have upwelling that is bringing cold ocean waters from depth to the surface, particularly in the east. That is, warm waters are pushed from the eastern Pacific towards the west, consequently producing a shallower thermocline in the east. Because of the shallower thermocline, it's naturally easier for the upwelling in order to bring colder, deep waters to the surface in this region. The combination then leads to a deeper thermocline that occurs in the west and a shallower thermocline in the east. This is reflected in many of the properties of the tropical atmosphere and ocean. What we generally see is warmer ocean temperatures and accumulated waters leading to higher sea levels in the western Pacific. This is in part because of the greater column height induced by warmer oceanic waters. That is, recall that warmer waters ten generally have lower density associated with them and higher surface height. This is because of thermal expansion of those ocean waters. Because of this, a circulation naturally emerges from this pattern, where waters are pushed from east to west, they then sink in the western Pacific, and recirculate so as to rise in the east, where upwelling is stronger. Here we see a schematic diagram showing the natural circulation that exists within the ocean, as well as the walker circulation which governs the atmospheric motions. Evaporation and solar heat are important in driving both of these processes. In the western Pacific, we see warmer ocean waters, as well as warmer surface temperatures, wetter conditions, and lower surface pressures. In the east, on the other hand, we tend to see cooler temperatures, drier conditions, as well as higher surface pressures. Recall these images showing the mean climatology of the global oceans. Here we see the sea surface height anomaly. As discussed, we see that in the western Pacific, sea surface heights tend to be higher than in the eastern Pacific. Again, this is in part driven by the easterly circulation in the oceans, pushing waters from east to west. Sea surface height is also influenced by thermal expansion of the warmer western Pacific ocean waters. 
near-surface temperatures show an analogous pattern. That is, we see warmer waters in the west and cooler waters in the east. Analogously, we see warmer near-surface temperatures in the west and cooler temperatures in the east. Again, the easterly flow that dominates the tropics in this region pushes the water from the east to the west. In the west, we get an accumulation of warmer near-surface waters that have been warmed through radiation. In the east, we get cooler temperatures because upwelling brings colder fluid from depth to the surface. Because of the presence of warmer temperatures in the western Pacific, it also has a propensity towards the generation of convection. That is, convection will tend to occur because of the warmer near-surface temperatures. Convection then vacates uh, air mass that is in the near surface in this region, leading to lower pressures overall. So what we generally see is lower pressures in the western Pacific and higher pressures in the eastern Pacific. This atmosphere-ocean interaction is known as the Bjerknes feedback. The particular phase of the Bjerknes feedback we've discussed is the positive phase. Under this phase, we obtain warmer sea surface temperatures in the western tropical Pacific and cooler sea surface temperatures in the eastern tropical Pacific. Again, this is driven by easterly wind stress that occurs along the equator. Because of warmer sea surface temperatures in the west, we end up generating convection in the west, which drives a strong walker circulation. The walker circulation recirculates air across the Pacific. That is, at higher altitudes, we have westerly flow. Air blows from west to east and subsides in the central and eastern Pacific. As a consequence, this air then drives easterly wind stress that acts on the ocean. That is, the air recirculates in order to replace the air that has been convected upward. Consequently, we obtain flow from east to west. The easterly wind stress then induces equatorial upwelling that brings up water that is colder than normal. This upwelling is again dominant in the eastern Pacific, leading to colder sea surface temperatures in the east. Consequently, this reinforces the cycle, producing warmer sea surface temperatures in the west and cooler sea surface temperatures in the east. Yerkney's feedback refers to this positive feedback cycle. In the tropics, it's responsible for enhancing the sea surface temperature gradient, that is, enhancing sea surface temperature differences between western Pacific and eastern Pacific, as well as amplifying the easterly wind stress. Thus, it's a feedback mechanism that works on both atmosphere and ocean, and enhances the connectivity between atmosphere and ocean. The results of this are depicted here. In the atmosphere, we again have low pressures occurring in the western Pacific, which is associated with convective activity. The convective activity drives the walker circulation, which results in westerly flow at altitude and subsiding mo motion in the central and eastern Pacific, that then drives high surface pressures in the east and central Pacific. The returning branch of the circulation then results in air moving from high pressure to low pressure in order to feed into the, convection, the convective plume. The easterly flow along the equator drives easterly motion along the tropical uh, ocean surface. This pushes warm waters from east to west and produces a warm pool in the western Pacific. In order to replace those waters, upwelling is enhanced in the eastern Pacific. Sinking motion in the western Pacific then provides water that recirculates in order to uh, fuel the upwelling. All right, now that we've talked about the basics of the tropical circulation, let's now look at the El Nino Southern Oscillation which has to do with strengthening and weakening of the circulation just discussed. So under the positive phase of the Bjerknes feedback, we already discussed how warmer sea surface temperatures in the western Pacific drive the walker circulation, which leads to easterly wind stress, equatorial upwelling, and enhances that western minus eastern sea surface temperature gradient. Uh, however, anomalous forcing, either extratropical effects in the atmosphere, or a relaxation in the tilt of the thermocline in the ocean, can potentially interrupt the Bjerknes feedback. This can actually result in the feedback being driven in reverse. Under the negative phase, some extratropical disturbance may result in a slightly weakened walker circulation. If the walker circulation is weakened, then the easterly wind stress is also weakened. This allows western Pacific waters to shift to the east, consequently moving that warm pool from the western Pacific to the central Pacific. 
Because of higher stratification now occurring in the eastern and central Pacific, this leads to a decrease in upwelling, which further enhances the near-surface temperatures. Thus, sea surface temperatures increase in the central and eastern Pacific, and decrease in the western Pacific, thus weakening the walker circulation further. If there is instead a, a oceanic driver to the reversal of the Bjerknes feedback, such as a change in the tilt of the thermocline, then we can go through an analogous cycle, except in this case we may start at the top, where a slight sea surface temperature increase in the central and eastern Pacific and a decrease in the western Pacific then drives the weakened walker circulation. As the walker circulation weakens, these feedbacks between atmosphere and ocean drive it weaker still, that is, a slightly weakened walker circulation will continue to weaken in accordance with uh, synchronization between atmosphere and ocean. Under these equatorial El Nino conditions, namely under the weakening of the walker circulation and the uh, tendency for the flow to be pushed into a negative phase, we have eastern forcing along the oceanic surface that's reduced from under the uh, normal conditions discussed earlier. These warmer surface waters then are shifted eastwards, leading to suppression and upwelling. With warmer wa waters now in the center of the Pacific, the region of deep convection shifts to this region as well. And so the low surface pressure region shifts from the western Pacific to the central Pacific, and so we tend to get more convection occurring in the central Pacific region. This also shifts the direction of the wind stresses, and so there's a tendency for the warmer ocean waters to not concentrate in the western Pacific, but now to concentrate in the central Pacific. Consequently, these El Nino conditions, or this strong negative phase, is associated with much warmer Pacific waters in the central and eastern Pacific. The circulation itself is also changed, with convection occurring primarily in the central Pacific and high pressures occurring in the east and west associated with subsiding motion. Upwelling is again suppressed in the ocean. Once the ocean has reached an El Nino state, some other extratropical disturbance or some disturbance in the ocean could easily turn the feedback cycle back to its positive phase, thus enhancing the walker circulation and driving it back towards the conditions described earlier in this lecture. The oscillation between these two states, that is, a weakened walker circulation and a strengthened walker circulation, or correspondingly between warm sea surface temperatures in the west and warm sea surface temperatures in the central Pacific, is known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Formally, the El Nino Southern Oscillation is a pattern of variation in winds and sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific Ocean with a period of about two to seven years. That is, the ocean atmosphere system tends to switch between El Nino and La Nina states with a period of about two to seven years. In the top plot here, we see the La Nina conditions, which is an enhanced state, uh, enhanced condition analogous to what we discussed earlier in this lecture. Under La Nina conditions, we have a strong walker circulation that again concentrates convective activity in the western Pacific, along with warmer ocean waters. The El Nino conditions are associated with a weak walker circulation, where convection is instead concentrated in the central Pacific, along with warmer Pacific Ocean waters. The transition process between these two states occurs because of a mutual interaction of the atmosphere-ocean system. That is, through the feedbacks that we've discussed in this class regarding how atmosphere and ocean interact with one another. The cold La Nina conditions shown in the top here correspond to an enhancement of the neutral state of the equatorial Pacific, where the neutral state is again what we discussed earlier in this lecture under tropical dynamics. It's also associated with a strengthening of the Bjerknes feedback, that is, the positive phase. Pressure decreases in the west and increases in the central Pacific. During the warm El Nino events, the warm pool instead spreads eastwards, bringing atmospheric convection along with it and weakening the walker circulation. Pressure increases in the west and decreases in the mid-ocean. Here are sea surface temperature patterns associated with La Nina conditions on the top, that is, positive phase ENSO, neutral conditions in the middle, and negative and so conditions or El Nino conditions on the bottom. These are three years in the 1990s where these patterns emerged in the tropical Pacific. On the top we see colder temperatures, a so-called cold tongue of fluid stretching along the eastern Pacific Ocean. This is strengthened upwelling that is then being carried westwards by the strong easterly wind stress. 
Under neutral conditions, we still see the presence of cooler sea surface temperatures in the east, but they're not as strong as they are under the La Nina conditions seen in the top plot. And under the El Nino conditions, we see no such presence of significantly stronger eastern Pacific cold temperatures. Instead, what we see is a fairly uniform temperature gradient between western Pacific and eastern Pacific. In particular, we see a strong enhancement here of central Pacific temperatures relative to the La Nina state shown above. Recall again, El Nino conditions are associated then with convective activity which tends to uh, occur in the central Pacific, whereas La Nina conditions, where we have western uh, Pacific temperatures being much higher than eastern Pacific temperatures, are associated with stronger convection in the western Pacific. So in summary, climatologically average conditions are not necessarily representative of the persistent climatological state of the Pacific. These El Nino conditions describe effectively uh, much of the variability that occurs within the Pacific Ocean. The tendency is, on this two to seven year cycle, for the Pacific to swap between El Nino and La Nina states. In fact, this equatorial Pacific region is subject to this non-seasonal variability, again occurring on uh, with a period of approximately two to seven years, associated with enhancement of the normal conditions and suppression of those conditions via the Bjorkney's feedback. The El Nino and La Nina are then warm and cool phases of this recurring climate pattern, known as ENSO. El Nino Southern Oscillation is an excellent topic to occur near the culmination of this class, because it's so representative of the mutual interactions that occur between the atmosphere and ocean. A weakening of the walker circulation and or eastward movement of the warm pool is the primary triggering mechanism for these El Nino events, and they lead to a process of steps which drive mutual interaction between the atmosphere-ocean system through processes that we've discussed earlier in the class. These mutual interactions then drive a feedback loop which can allow the system to swap between these two states. Under the first step of this transition, the atmosphere responds naturally to the ocean. That is, the east-west pressure gradient is reduced due to changes in the lower boundary, leading to a weakening of the walker circulation. Under the second step, the ocean naturally responds to the atmosphere. That is, with the weakening wind stress, equatorial upwelling is also weakened and the thermocline deepens. This raises the sea surface temperatures in the east, leading to a more uniform distribution of sea surface temperatures across the equatorial Pacific. The transition from El Nino to La Nina it essentially occurs from running this above feedback in reverse, but again occurs because of mutual interactions between atmosphere and ocean systems. Here's another depiction of the conditions of the atmosphere and ocean under ENSO, again emphasizing some of the key characteristics that we've seen. Under El Nino conditions, convection is dominant in the Central Pacific. Warm water concentrates in the Central Pacific and tends to sink here as well, driving weaker upwelling in the Eastern Pacific. Under La Nina conditions, we have strong trade winds that reach across the extent of the equatorial Pacific, driving higher sea surface temperatures in the west, warmer waters in the west, as well as convection in the west. Neutral conditions appear more similar to La Nina conditions in terms of the location of convection. However, they're associated with weaker trade winds, weaker easterly wind stress, and thus a weaker circulation in both the atmosphere and the ocean. The state of ENSO is usually quantified using an index such as the Southern Oscillation Index, although other indices are available that rely on variables such as sea surface temperature. However, the Southern Oscillation Index takes advantage of the fact that the sea level pressure minima and maxima shift during La Nina and El Nino conditions. That is, under La Nina conditions, we typically have lower sea level pressures in Darwin and higher sea level pressures in Tahiti. Darwin is our representative location in the Western Pacific, over the Maritime Continent. Tahiti is our representative location for the Central Pacific, being located on an island in the Central Pacific. These two locations are chosen because of the relatively long sea level pressure record. Both locations are located slightly south of the equator, Darwin at 12 degrees south and Tahiti at 17 degrees south. Here is a plot of the Trans-Pacific Dipole, which is a representation of these pressure differences that occur across the Pacific. Whenever pressures are high in Darwin, we see low pressures that occur in Tahiti, with almost perfect anti-correlation. Consequently, these two locations are very representative of this trans-Pacific dipole.
Monthly values of the Southern Oscillation Index are shown here, dating back to before 1880. Again, positive values are associated with a tendency for lower sea level pressures in the Western Pacific, and negative values are associated with lower sea, sea level pressures in the Central Pacific. Whenever the index shows sustained values above plus 7, we usually refer to that as a La Nina event. Whenever the sustained value is below negative 7, we refer to that as an El Nino event. Major La Nina events occurred in 1973 to 74, 75 to 76, 88 to 89, 98 to 99, and 2010 to 2011. Major El Nino events occurred in 1982 to 83, 97 to 98, and 2015 to 2016. Here we see in the top plot the Southern Oscillation Index, and in the bottom plot we see the sea surface temperature differences under the Nino 3.4 region, which is a measurement region for sea surface temperatures in the Central Pacific. What we see is near exact anti-correlation between the Southern Oscillation Index and sea surface temperatures within this region. That is, whenever an El Nino event occurs corresponding to a negative value of the Southern Oscillation Index, we see much warmer temperatures through the Central Pacific. Analogously, when we see a positive Southern Oscillation Index, we see much cooler sea surface temperatures than the Central Pacific. The time series here has been filtered to remove short-term oscillations and make it clearer to see these correlations. Under El Nino conditions, there are a number of global factors that result because of these much warmer conditions. In what we've discussed so far in this class, we have learned that changes in the tropics can influence the Hadley circulation, which can have ramifications for the whole globe. Under El Nino conditions, during the December, January, February season, that is the Northern Hemisphere winter, El Nino conditions are associated with wetter and warmer conditions along the tropical Central Pacific and tropical Eastern Pacific, but also associated with drier and warmer conditions in the Western Pacific. However, this oscillation also can touch regions all over the world. In North America, El Nino conditions are associated with warmer temperatures along the periphery of the Pacific, particularly along the Alaskan seaboard, and in Japan. But we also have wet conditions that occur, for instance, in Southern California under El Nino conditions, as well as wet and cool conditions that extend throughout the eastern U.S. along the Gulf of Mexico coast. Under the June, July, August season, El Nino conditions are associated with dry conditions in the Western Pacific and dry and cool in Northeastern Australia and New Zealand, but associated with wet conditions in the Central Pacific. In the Southern Hemisphere, El Nino conditions in June, July, August are associated again with warm temperatures along the Pacific periphery, as well as warmer temperatures in southeastern Brazil. Under La Nina conditions, we see essentially the opposite. Under the Northern Hemisphere winter season, La Nina conditions are associated with the wetter, a wetter Western Pacific, a drier and cooler Central and Eastern Pacific, cooler temperatures along the Alaskan seaboard and in Canada, and cooler temperatures in Japan. We also see wetter conditions typically in the Pacific Northwest, but drier and warmer conditions in the U.S. Southeast. In the Southern Hemisphere winter season, La Nina conditions are associated with cooler temperatures along uh, in Chile and Peru. This is again associated with cooler sea surface temperatures in this region, as well as wetter and cooler temperatures in uh, wetter and cooler conditions in northern South America. We also see drier conditions in the Central Pacific and wetter and warmer conditions in the Western Pacific. El Nino is very closely connected to global temperatures. Here we see a plot of the global temperature anomalies showing a clear anthropogenic signal towards warming conditions, warming temperatures as we get closer to present. But on top of that anthropogenic signal, we also see strong variations associated with El Nino and La Nina conditions. During El Nino events, the warm waters spread across much of the Pacific, and consequently we have a much larger area of warmer waters that can affect global sea surface temperature measurements. It also results in much warmer near surface temperatures in the atmosphere, which can enhance the moisture content of the atmosphere. Also, enhanced convection because of the warmer temperatures throughout the Pacific can enhance the strength of the Hadley circulation, and hence the storm track in the mid-latitudes. Under La Nina conditions, the cold tongue extends further west along the 
uh, from the eastern Pacific. Consequently, we observe cooler overall global temperatures because there is a large extent of colder, deep ocean waters that have been brought up along this region. El Nino is also strongly connected with extreme weather events. Tropical cyclone activity in the North Atlantic Basin is particularly sensitive to El Nino influences. When a moderate to strong El Nino event is present, the North Atlantic Basin tends to experience a substantial reduction in cyclone numbers, a 60% reduction in the number of hurricane days, and an overall reduction in system intensity. This change is due to stronger than normal westerly winds that typically occur during these El Nino years, and hence the tendency towards greater shearing in the atmosphere. All right, that's all for today. Thank you very much. Next time we'll be talking about paleoclimate.